best as we can for everybody in the world who uses and wants to use a library service. There are many things in this budget that have been overlooked because of the inevitable focus on leisure centres, on libraries, on golf courses. Our youth provision is being cut back. Our amendment would restore the £100,000 to invest in our young people and preserve employment within the council. Environmental services are being, are being significantly impacted. The Eric service for bulky waste collection will go up in price, again hitting people hardest who don't have access to a car, inevitably resulting in even more fly tipping, which already blights so many parts of our work. Allotment fees would increase to extremely high levels compared to other local authorities. There would be a charge for grey bins and the inevitable impact that would have on our already very, very disappointing recycling rates. And then there's the climate emergency. You might remember that. We all voted to declare a climate emergency. And with impeccable timing there, today the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has produced and released its latest report. It says climate breakdown is accelerating rapidly. Many of the impacts will be more severe than predicted, and there is only a narrow chance left of avoiding its worst ravages. Plus, we've heard all that before, haven't we? We've had report after report after report screaming at us that Earth's life support systems are collapsing all around us. Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General, said today, I have seen many scientific reports in my time, but nothing like this. Today's report is an atlas of human suffering and a damning indictment of failed climate leadership. Well, we don't have to look very far, do we, for failed climate leadership. It was there for everybody to see at the policy and resources committee. And Mayor, I'm tired of hearing councillors make big speeches about how much they care about the climate, how much they want to address the climate emergency and how important it is for future generations that we do the right thing. But when push comes to shove, time and time again, we see councillors failing, failing to act, failing to turn warm words into proper action. And the budget alteration as published in the supplementary papers, is really an embarrassing attempt to whitewash over that failure. It does not restore the climate emergency budget. So our amendments, Mr Mayor, would address those specific aspects of the budget that we seek to mitigate, and I commend that to all councillors. Thank you. Councillor Walsh, uh, a seconder, do you wish to speak now or reserve your rights until the end of the debate? Reserve until the end, Mr. Mayor. Thank, Thank you. Moves to the independent group and it's Councillor Hayes as group leader uh, for the independent group. You now have up to 15 minutes to speak to your debate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I won't require 15 minutes, what I have to say. Uh, Mr. Mayor, with the obligation to make a lawful budget each year, we have to agree on a balanced budget despite the conditions imposed upon us. Future restraints put upon us by the two reports we recently received and recommendations contained therein, and also with the need to have an agreed capitalisation amount from the government to help balance our budget. We, now have, we are now essentially on trial. There's an independent panel monitoring our progress, which will report back to the government should they feel we are not measuring up or fulfilling many of the recommendations that have been set. Therefore, it's important that we recognise that we have a gun to our head and we must agree to things to meet the required balanced budget amounts, which many of our residents, who we wish to protect, will not be happy with. The alternative reality, however, is much, much worse. The truth is, none of us here wants these proposed cuts. And I believe all here tonight, by our proposals and our amendments, have attempted to mitigate the pain for our residents in only the limited way they can. So I criticised decisions made in previous years 
the situation we find ourselves. But our reality is, is that we have over the last decade or so been subject to very large success cuts by the government. The council attempted to offset these cuts in many cases by tapping into our reserves and members have allowed this to happen to maintain the status quo for our residents who we have genuinely attempted to protect. Some money making attempts did not work out and a loss occurred and some could perhaps be criticised. However, in terms of relativity, these pale into insignificance when we compare them to the total amount of drastic debilitating cuts this government has made to most councils, including ours, over the last decade or so. However, I also feel it's true to say that because the government policies such as the dogma of austerity, which appears to have caused the rich getting richer on the backs of the poor getting poorer, nearly all councils and their residents are in a bad position this year, especially with the cost of COVID, which I believe have been exacerbated by political dithering, causing greater overall effects on our economy. Nationally, we have, wasted, we have recent losses due to the illegal VIP lane process, wastefully given out billions of pounds of money, allegedly to known acquaintances of government officials, and also reluctance to investigate four billion pounds of COVID fraud. These, I have no doubt, have contributed to the government clawing back even more money from the ordinary person on the street. We could help rebalance the national economy by taxing much more those rich beneficiaries of government decisions, including large corporations who seem to avoid part, paying hardly any tax, yet use our infrastructure freely and use offshore loopholes. Just how much more money do multi-millionaires and billionaires need? Instead, we have a council who has to make further cuts affecting residents directly linked to insufficient ongoing government funding for our services. <coughs> With this in mind, ultimately I blame our government for the position we find ourselves. We are in no position to fight these cuts due to the threat of being taken over by government administrators, the legal re repercussion of not balancing our budgets. The real power lies in Westminster, and it is they who determine and give a strong steer towards the life our residents lead. The independent group will be supporting the budget recommendation of the Council, despite having a heavy heart. Excuse me. Having Despite having a heavy heart to do so, we will support the Labour budget proposal as possibly amended and we will be trying to protect services the best way we possibly can with a view to support asset transfer of some services, whatever possible, but realising there are and must be time restraints. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Council Bird, you now have up to 15 minutes to speak to your budget amendment. Thank you very much. Bromborough loves our library. Over 2,000 people of all ages have signed a petition to save it. And other communities feel very similar. Higher Bebbington, Greasby, Hoylake, Irby, Hensby, Prenton, Rock Ferry, Woodchurch and Wallasey Village, they love their libraries too. And my amendment, my library amendment, means that we can save them all, at least for one year. There's no need for council cuts, of these cuts to libraries swimming pools and golf courses. There was no need, in my view, for a loan from the government last year bring an intervention that's not welcome. These are political choices, and let me show you why. Where will Council's net income for next, next year? It's forecast to be £330 million, £163 million coming in from your Council tax, £139 million from your business rates, and from government grants, £28 million. In 2010, the government grant without business rates was 68 million. Nothing like the 267 million claimed in the latest uh, lies leaflet from Labour. Even if you include the business rates, then it, that would come to 192 million, 75 million less than what Labour's leaflet is claiming. The Tory cuts are cruel, and the nerve of the leader of the Conservative group to lecture us about how beneficial the Conservative government has been. This Conservative government is the ones that a judge found have made unlawful COVID contracts, fast-track VIP lane, a large proportion going to Tory party donors, public money going into private hands. That's what the Tories are very good at. And all the while, while, you know, while people are not able to visit their dying relatives in hospital, they're having parties in 10 Downing Street laughing at us. It's a shame. shame. We can
councillors, we are elected politicians. We're elected by the public to make political choices about public money raised from the public to be spent for public benefit. Are your ward councillors going to vote for cuts to libraries, swimming pools and golf courses? Are they going to put party before people? Or, or are your councillors voting for the many or for the money? The council budget this year is shown by this money here, £330. The budget proposals to be voted on today would reduce neighbourhoods by £4 million, reduce resources by £1.5 million, and reduce law and governance by £300,000. Adults' budget would be increased by five million, children's by half a million, and regeneration by a million. That's the effect of all the comings and goings and the, the physical props are here for the rest of the meeting if you want to come and have a look. There's a planned budget surplus of £440,000 that would keep all the libraries open until November. The additional cost of keeping the libraries open for a full year is about £330,000. We couldn't hear it's 35p. You know, and um, it's, the office, senior officers agreed that libraries could be funded from the financial resilience reserve of £375,000 as a one-off. To keep Woodchurch Leisure Centre running would cost the council £40,000. Just this out of all this budget. Um, Europa Fun Pool, £266,000. And Brackenwood Golf Course, to keep it open just for September, would cost £50,000. So where can we possibly find this total amount of £716,000? All these departments are saying, no, no, there's nothing else that we can give here. It's all taken for. Mm. What about all the shiny investments that the the Labour cabinet made in recent years. Six of them are still with us today. Um, all the pet projects that we had, let's have a look. There's an envelope here. We're all growth company. We've put a good two million pounds into there. Is there anything coming back? No. Not even the external um, assurance reports can say that we can't count any money coming back in from We're all growth company. What have we got in the bank? Well, so there's the general fund balances of, of 10 million, uh, 10.7 million, which needs to be increased. There's the, in the earmarked reserves, we've got two types. One kind of reserve that isn't legal to spend because it's for schools and other um, contracts, that's 40.7 million. And then there's this 27 million pounds of, of reserves, which are earmarked. For, certain things, but they're also legal to reallocate. They could be repurposed. Um, so, but when we've asked, can we repurpose these earmarked reserves, we're told no, we can't, they're all you know, earmarked for something that was earmarked in the past. But even the um, council's auditor says there's over 20 million pounds in earmarked reserves that could be used to deal with any savings shortfall. There's no written report, there's no assessment, there's no ranking of these earmarked reserves about why it's more important to keep these than to spend them on keeping services open. Oh, apart from two and a half million that are going moving from earmarked reserves into general fund reserves, half a million for children's, half a million for leisure, um, but there's half a million also going into waste. For the waste levy, not next year, but for the year after. The earmarked reserves can move around. And I'm glad to say that 375,000 has been identified that could be used to keep libraries open. It doesn't seem right to me that 400 people employed by Royal Council last year were paid more than £50,000, almost double the average salary on the Wirral. Wirral Council spent £24 million on such sal salaries and settlements pay. The top 10 senior leadership team alone cost £1.4 million. Yet they have not been able to bring forward proposals to balance the budget without cutting libraries, leisure centres and golf courses. 
councillors and members of the public, another will is possible. We can have public services for everybody. Contractors pay the real living wage. Warm homes, good schools, decent jobs and swimming pools, adult care and clean air and refugees being welcomed here. We can have a publicly delivered national health service. But we need to vote for it today and in the elections in May. So the First Amendment before you from myself is about Europa Fun Hall. It's been turned into yet another gym, but we don't need to throw in the towel or wave goodbye to fun for youngsters, thousands of youngsters. The pool can at least break even during the summer holidays. Leisure Committee voted to reopen the fun pool as soon as COVID allows. This amendment merely asked us to restate our intentions to pause the reopening of Europa Fun Pool, not to permanently close it. And who knows, we might have councillors here this time next year who can find £270,000 to reopen Europa Fun Pool. And secondly, libraries. Officers agree that we can legally vote to save all our libraries for one year. It would still keep the three million contingency reserve and it's a perfectly legal way to save our services. So please vote for these amendments. Thank you very much. Councillor Cook, a seconder. Do you wish to speak now or reserve your right until the end of the debate? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, I'll speak now if that's all right. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, and give people a chance to recover from it uh, during the break, perhaps. Um, yes, I, I didn't become a councillor to see services cut even further with an ever shrinking core of council workers. In 2010, Wirraborough Council employed over 6,000 officers. This year, only 3,000 plus full time equivalent. Uh, in a speech uh, just now, Councillor Bird has talked about political choices. Uh, I believe it's strong local government with greater devolved, hence democratic, and financial power with a greater, not an ever diminishing role in communities. <clears throat> Democracy is from the Greek, as many people know, and means ruled by the people, not by swollen teams of financial experts dazzling us with arcane terminology as seen in today's 550-page agenda pack. Um, finance started out as a convenient, transparent means of exchange to serve people, not to bewilder, browbeat and subjugate them. So today, undemocratically, we're being forced to contract the council and further reduce services with almost inevitable compulsory redundancies, as has been referred to already. This runs against the ideological grain of well over half the members of this council. And all because of a budgetary deficit, which in the grand scheme of things is ludicrously small, having now come down to around six billion pounds need for capitalization. Many councillors have challenged the independent panel and senior officers, including ourselves, over their insistence on building up an excessively high reserve fund and refusing to bring down the three million pounds set aside to ensure against failure to deliver cuts next year, despite the big drop in capitalisation requirements. The average wage for Premier League football is just over 60,000 pounds a week, which equates to more than three million pounds a year, about half the total we're talking about. Top players get 250,000 pounds a week during a meeting with members of the independent panel, I suggested there may be a couple of these footballers with links to Wirral who could donate a few weeks' wages to Wirral Council. I wasn't entirely joking. There is, however, some cause for optimism. One way of mitigating the impact of budget cuts is to encourage community asset transfers, that have been referred to positively already this evening, at least in certain cases, and these will be discussed by many members in speeches later on this evening, I'm sure. Many people have suffered financial hardship under COVID, and the economic situation is likely to get worse, as we all know. However, overall savings have actually increased among the more fortunate who have been unable to spend as much of their disposable income as before. People in this situation should be afforded the opportunity to contribute, to have a mechanism for contributing to saving the services they value through charitable trusts, 
crowdfunding or other possible ways of making donations. And donations can be used for revenue spending. I'll be campaigning for this next year and indeed I've already started. Insistence on eliminating our so-named structural deficit shows an intent by government to force us to close services and cut jobs for good. The abusive power relationship which central government uses to control and overrule the, de under the democratic mandate of local government brings to mind an analogy with international trade relationships. The term structural, remember structural deficit, structural reform comes from a neoliberal world view fostering an abusive relationship whereby rich countries exploit former colonies and other developing countries in order to extract wealth from them through unequal trade treaties and via the International Monetary Fund and World Bank. Yes, the dialogue goes something like this, we'll lend you money, even reschedule your debts, provided you ignore your own electorate and restructure your economy in favour uh, of our richer countries. Now, what does that remind you of? Now, just to conclude, the other day I looked on the official government website to see what it said about the newly named Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities. It says it worked with 13 agencies and public bodies. I'm not going to list them all, It'll take too long. Two executive agencies, six executive non-departmental public bodies, one advisory non-departmental public body, one public corporation, that's the first 11 listed of the 13, and now, under the heading Other, an afterthought, coming in at number 12, we've got local government. That's what they think of us upstairs. Now, George Orwell warned us against trusting ministers ministries which keep changing their names. <laughs> and DLUC is the third name in four years. As I hinted before, central government doesn't know how to deal with councils, doesn't really care much about us, and so when it can, it avoids talking about us and to us. Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities. Note, no mention at all this time of local government. George Orwell's ministries were Ministry of Truth, meaning lies, Ministry of Peace, meaning war, Ministry of Love, meaning hate, Ministry of Plenty, meaning scarcity. I think that best fits deal up then, doesn't it? Perhaps we should call this department for lousing up whole communities, <laughs> or better still, as that was cheating with a silent W, in whole department for leaving ugly holes in communities. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lath. Thank you. That completes the actual um, leaders and deputies or whoever has had the opportunity to think. Before we go into the, uh, anyone else would wish to speak, I'm going to actually say now we have our 10 minute break. It's now 25 to nearly, so please be back at quarter to eight, as don't forget the guillotine will be nine o'clock. Thank you.